I'm joined now by founding editor and writer of Miss Magazine, who has also published 11 books, not to mention she's a Brandeis alum. On behalf of myself and Brandeis University, Letty Pogrebin, thank you for joining the program today. My pleasure to be with you. To start, can you briefly take us through the start of Miss Magazine and how you found your role within the company? Yes, um, I met Gloria Steinem at an event that sort of should go down in history, and that's the founding of the National Women's Political Caucus. And uh, we worked together on writing some of the principles that came out of that get together where we founded a group that was bipartisan, uh, but concerned with women's issues. And uh, Gloria and I got along and she said, maybe you'd like to, when we get back to New York, this was a meeting in Washington, she said, when we get back to New York, maybe you'd like to join these meetings we've been having um, to plan how to, how to start a, a feminist magazine, a real feminist magazine. I mean, there were a lot of newsletters and mimeographed kind of papers. It was, don't forget, it was 1971 when that first meeting took place. And uh, of course I was interested. I mean, I was, as a matter of fact, awed by Gloria, as everyone is, but she's, um, she's an angel. She's, she's the real deal. And what you see is what you get. She's, a pleasure to work with. And so um, we started having, you know, periodic meetings, and then we published uh, what we called the preview issue. And that was in January uh, 1972. And we made it a very fat issue because we felt, well, if we don't make it, at least we should sort of have one of every message out. Mm -hmm. So we had a piece on you know, housewives and marriage contracts. And we also had, so had a political org organizing piece and uh, lesbians and um, show, things having to do with children. And it was jam packed. And, you know, we had no idea that we could in fact um, build an audience all across the country because basically uh, the feminist publications that existed were kind of local or they were college oriented. <coughs> And so um, we thought it would last eight weeks. We put it on newsstands. Of course, there were some that didn't even take, some newsstands were offended by a feminist magazine. Don't forget that was actually almost 50 years ago. How can that be? And uh, in any case, it didn't last eight weeks. It was sold out, sold out in eight days. And so we knew we were onto something because it sold out everywhere. It didn't just sell in, you know, Chicago or at Northwestern or didn't sell in Cambridge. It just was buffo. And we got tremendous press and, you know, kind of the rest is history. But just to give you a rounded view of the chronology, we were so overwhelmed by our success and we needed, you know, six months to get kind of geared up for monthly publication. And that started in, in uh, July, in um, 1972 in July. And we were, for all my time there, we were, we were monthly. Over the course of years, you know, there were hardships and we had to become nonprofit. Then we couldn't cover politics in quite the same way. So we got out of the nonprofit. But I'm happy to say that the Feminist Majority Foundation bought us several years ago, many years ago. And they've made it into quite a, a, an admirable journal, a little more serious than we were. We were a little kind of pop culture-y as well as um, really substantive. And they cover um, the international scene and I'm proud of them. And I think they're a quarterly. So that do, brings you up to date. Do you attribute the growth of the magazine with your audience or more just that there's so many issues that you can talk about and interests that you can cover? Yeah. Um, I think it really served a, a, a need. I mean, people were hungry to connect with others who were feeling as they did. Don't forget, there were little islands of feminist fervor and activism, but there wasn't a movement in the sense that, you know, well, there was the 1970 Women's March that established a, a kind of set of principles. But I think the connection that people felt through, through Ms. and our letters to the editor that was part of the allure. People read it because they saw themselves reflected in it. And they also wrote in, we had mail bags up the kazoo. I mean, nobody had as many letters as we did. We were stunned by the response to issues that women's magazines, traditional women's magazines never covered. I mean, nobody did 
you know, a, an article on incest or um, on the, you know, misdeeds of the medical industrial complex where it comes to birth, for example, sexism on campus, sexism in the military. Nobody was writing about that. You know, it was basically how to please your husband and 33 ways to make hamburgers. And we weren't that, you know. So it was, a, it was a joy to be part of this. It was part of the revolution. You know, the, the, the women's movement had, was a, a tremendous spectrum. People think of it as, you know, well, you have an image of a woman, many do, you know, in combat boots and, and overalls. Uh, but, you know, there are women in Chanel suits and pearls. There are women who don't care what they wear. There are women who are, you know, single mothers and there are women with seven children. The, um, the commonalities cut across all those lines. So we were dealing with class and race. We we're dealing with anger and pleasure. We were looking at the picky you and the little things that you don't even think about, like became very kind of um, controversial, whether women should shave their legs. Well, you know, I don't relate to that, but there are women who, who did. And so there was something for everybody. And most of all, we really established that women are people. You know, we weren't uh, off in some ghetto where all we care about are, you know, how to arrange flowers or, you know, it's, it's wonderful. I have three children, you, you know, articles about children were always in Ms. In fact, I, I pioneered the Stories for Free Children section, which uh, almost kind of connected us to Marlo Thomas, which gave birth to Free to Be You and Me, which is a classic of family and entertainment. Got a lot of well-known people involved and it was non-sexist, non-racist, multicultural, a real consciousness raiser. And also, you know, the songs were in your head for years. I don't know if you were raised on it, but three generations have been raised on Free to Be You, on you and Me. And William, I've suggested if you ha don't know it and haven't seen it, get it online. It's just a joy. Publishing a number of books, yet also contributor for Moment Magazine and writing pieces for a plethora of newspaper and magazine firms. How do you find your approaches to writing change when you write for one platform versus another? Um, not a lot. I, I mean, I think it's kind of like politicians who speak differently to different constituencies and you never know what they really believe. I try to be myself. I was the authentic. Into, yeah, not, not just authentic, but the tone. I'm not going to suddenly be, you know, cool and hip, and, and then suddenly I'm like a serious, dogged kind of intellectual. Mm -hmm. But I do indulge my love of words more if I'm writing in a serious journal that has a lot of room for words. Otherwise, now you're writing, you know, 750 words that's on a page. and you got to sum it up. Um, and I think it's also important to have an interplay between what you write and what you say. Uh, I, I, I'm a speaker. I go all over the country. And the only thing that I hear from people that shows they, they're surprised is they say, I thought you would be taller. <laughs> they don't say, oh, you know, wow, you sounded completely different. What happened to what you once said? And why aren't you this? I'm consistent, you know, what you see is what you get and you're going to, you know, you're going to get a mixture of radical feminism and you're going to get, um, you know, a woman with three children and six grandchildren who has a lot of the same issues that other women in family situations do. So I, I feel as if I have, you know, I can't be really typecast. What astonishes me is how, and you know, I hope whoever's listening to this gets guilt tripped <laughs> because it astonishes me. I mean, I am unbelievably, or, or can't even say at 82 years old, I feel like I'm 36. I always felt 36, even when I was 21. And I thought when I was 36, well, this movement is so kind of such a prima facie example of, a, of justice waiting to be served. How can you not hear the inequities? How can you not see the statistics? How can you not recognize it in your own life? Once everybody does, they'll fix it. Well, we fixed a lot of stuff in the 60s and 70s, then we started losing it in the 80s under 
under uh, Reagan. And then suddenly there was major pushback and suddenly we had a backlash and suddenly we had a, a right wing fundamentalism and suddenly we were, had an anti-choice. So we were so effective that we aroused the other side and we've been kind of hanging on by our nails. And I did not, I mean, I think my consciousness was raised and I started calling myself a feminist in 1970. I wasn't among the first. There were many women were, who were way ahead of the game in terms of really kind of doing a, 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 a gender analysis or adding a gender analysis to a class analysis. I don't want to bifurcate them, but broadening the perspective. Um, but I didn't get it. I didn't get it in the kishkas until 1970, when I really saw other women's lives and didn't just say, you know, well, I'm doing fine, so women can make it. Because I, I spent uh, 10 years in the book publishing industry and I ended up as vice president of my company before I ever went to Ms. And, and I was what we call a queen bee. You know, somebody is like, you know, why aren't you just doing what I did? And suddenly I look at other women's lives and they don't have a husband who's a lawyer, so I don't have to write for money. They don't have, you know, a, a comfortable home with a housekeeper who comes once a week. You know, they're not in the same position I'm in. So I, I had better stop strutting around and thinking that my way or the highway, you know. And I began to see the marvelous kind of um, variations of accommodation and rebellion that defined the move, movement. You know, there were now if you felt comfortable, you know, being a little more moderate. You know, red stockings if you wanted to go all the way, the, you know, this way. And there were, you know, ra Republican, you know, there were Republicans for choice. <laughs> you know, which now it's it's really hard to find one. Um, so what I loved so much was that multiplicity and the ability to march together with different signs. And it's so hard now to imagine that. We used to say sisterhood is powerful. And it's hard to say that in some circumstances now. As you talk about a variety of, I guess, presidential administrations, how do you believe the role and influence of Congress and advocacy slash nonprofit groups have changed involving women's rights since you started working at this magazine? Well, I, I worked there for 17 years and I haven't been there for mm, like 25. So I don't just define my feminism by my years at Ms. I have been involved in many, many organizations. I've helped to inaugurate uh, many organizations and a lot of my interests sort of started to move toward the Israel-Palestine situation. But to answer your question more directly, I realized during the Trump years that there are limits to um, NGO act activism. There are limits to thinking that you can only act locally or being only grassrootsy. And I think Congress is where it happens. At this point, the vote, we've got to have the vote because that's the only way we got rid of this guy. We didn't get rid of this guy marching in the streets. We didn't get rid of this guy by having meetings and making coalitions so we could get a traffic light on a crosswalk. We got rid of him through the vote. And now that they know that and are, are putting barriers up, I think that that's probably the most important thing you can do right now is uh, attack a voter suppression and fight it tooth and nail. Um, the courts are important. Look what happened to the Supreme Court. Now it looks like we're going to lose choice, possibly entirely, or it's going to be gutted. Um, Roe v. Wade will be gutted to the point where you know you'll have to travel to New York from South Dakota if you if you need an abortion, and it's it's an outrage. It's a travesty. And in a way, uh, we let Congress off the hook because I remember when a candidate had to answer, really had to have a position and had to stand there and answer questions about uh, the feminist agenda, 10 items. You know, media people who, who had a feminist inclination or at least whose consciousness were raised to the point where they recognized that you know, women are half the human race and maybe we need to pay some attention to the things that are uniquely uh, 
painful and hurtful to women. And now, you, you know, in these elections, you just don't hear those questions. You can go through a presidential event, a, a debate, and not hear a word about choice, not hear a word about the fact that the um, majority of people in, in poverty at the bottom are, are single women with children. Why is it wasn't that an issue? It's a women's issue, it's a family issue, it's a societal issue, and yet we don't hurt, hold their feet to the fire. So, you know, I, I, I hate to sound like one of those curmudgeonly old, we used to, we had it better, we used to do it better. You know, why aren't you, why aren't you out there, you know, beating the bushes the way we did? Why aren't you, you know, throwing money over the <laughs> balcony of the stock exchange the way Abby Hoffman did? You know, why aren't you really hitting them hard? And we used to camp out in front of um, co congressional offices until they said, we'll vote for this. We will, we'll, okay, okay, go, we'll vote for it. You know, and to not pay attention because it's like your grandparents' institution is lunacy because they're gonna take, take this country away from, from you. You know, I love young people. I love the fervor. I thought, think the climate activists are fabulous. Um, but again, this this is after you know we've just come out of the, the climate summit in Glasgow, and if that doesn't translate into congressional action and presidential commitments, and it was all for nothing. It's for nothing. It's to make people feel good. It was really you know inspiring to see everybody get. I mean, you know, I've been in those crowds. I've been in those meeting rooms. I've sat on the floor. I've lied lie down on the street. I know how good that solidarity solidarity feels. But it boils down to who's in the Congress, who's in the Oval Office, and who ends up in the court. The right wing knew it, knew what to do, and they did it. They started with school boards. They started with city councils. They affected then, you know, uh, uh, altering um, voting districts. And suddenly, you know, they're they're like stealth. They're like stealth right wing radicals. They're in there and they're putting people on, on the bench. Now we have so many um, ju judicial vacancies and somehow or other we can't get our people on the bench because we have an obstructionist uh, uh, Congress. So wh for whoever is listening who's young and thinks, well, that's, again, that's your grandparents' institution. We don't, we're not gonna, we're not interested. You know, we're not into uh, electoral politics, too many compromises, drives me crazy. Drives me crazy. Okay, you don't like compromise, so then they'll just, you know, run right all over you because there's no way to stop them. Mm. That would be my message is don't give up on the mainstream institutions. Take over them. Take them over. Serving two terms as chair of the board of American for Peace Now, an advocacy organization working to find a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a member of numerous Jewish-Palestinian dialogue groups, and founder of the International Center for Peace in the Middle East, can you discuss your interest in this issue and how your views and perspectives have changed over the years? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, you know, I, I was born in, into a, a hyper Zionist household. Um, I was born, I was nine years old when Israel became a state. I grew up with Israel. I was in all, every possible youth organization, um, but I didn't go to Israel till I was 36 years old. And I tried to analyze it. You know, when you're writing a book and you have to kind of stand behind what you write, I discovered, as you do, I gather in therapy, that the reason I didn't go to Israel was because Israel was my sibling rival. There was too much Zionism in my life. My father was going to meetings every night. My mother was raising money for Hadassah. It, I, I said, Israel is my sibling rival. And... So I rejected Israel. And um, when I was part of a group in 1975 that organized a petition, uh, number 76, to, uh, to object to the Zionism is racism <clears throat> resolution that was passed uh, at the UN Women's Conference, uh, the first one in Mexico City, we organized this petition because nobody else was doing it. I mean, Nobody else was doing it. And so a bunch of feminists, I think there were 12 of us, we, and we got you know thousands and thousands of signatures. And the reason I went to Israel that year 
is because the government gave us a free trip to thank us. Now, I wasn't, I'm not a, 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 a traditional so-called objective journalist, so I had no problem going. I didn't have to be um, neutral. I was an advocacy journalist, I still am. Um, so I accepted that, you know, it's, it's a perk. I accepted it and I went with my husband and we were a really eclectic group and I had never been there. And I did all the sort of, um, you know, traditional sightseeing. And then I made it my business to find the feminists, to find the counterculture people, to talk to women who had split off and made a women's party. Nashim, Ezra Nashim, and uh, made lifelong friendships during that time. And when I came back, I was so blown away by the good stuff. And I didn't notice the bad stuff because, I mean, it was the first time. But I was so blown away that I went back and I talked to my sister editors and I said, I want to make a, a Ms. trip to Israel. And we put an ad, in, you know, every temple has a sisterhood, right? So, you know, feminism is a sisterhood. We put an ad in the Times, full page, our sisterhood is going to Israel. And of course, we meant the feminist sisterhood. Sisterhood is powerful kind of sisterhood. And 50, uh, 52 women and six men signed up. And we took up a big part of, of a jet plane. And this time, we did minimal sightseeing and maximal feminist organizing and grassroots kind of interactions and coalition building. And we just learned the, the lay of the land. And I noticed this time, and also because I went and really sought out uh, Israel, uh, Israeli, Palestinian Israelis, you know, people who are citizens of Israel, but are Arabs. And I saw a whole different perspective. So that was my wake up call. And uh, when I came back, I wrote a very long piece uh, about uh, about what it what that trip meant to me and the contradictions and so on, and um, I just felt I need to get into this issue because we are living, you know, side by side with people we don't know, who we rule over. When I say we, I go to, from from you know they to we because I totally identify with Israel. You know, I grew up with Israel, and I and I. I criticize who I love, you know, I criticize people in my family if I feel they're really kind of going off the path, as they say. And I started to feel that way. I said, who better, who better to sort of say, wait a minute, this is not Jewish. This is an un-Jewish law. This is an un-Jewish form of racism. This is, you know, and kind of wrote about it in a critical but loving way. Um, you know, they, uh, um, Hartman, the person who founded the Hartman Institute, David Hartman, philosopher, rabbi, um, and there's a Hartman Institute here and in, 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 in Israel. He once said, you should uh, criticize Israel like a mother, not a mother-in-law. And that seemed quite profound to me. You know, um, you feel the difference. I'm a mother-in-law and I hope nobody thinks that I, I'm like, two-faced about any of my values, but the person you trust more than your mother-in-law is your mother. To want the best for you, to be selfless, to criticize out of commitment. And that's the way I felt all along. So I got involved in the um, International Center of Peace for Peace in the Middle East, which is now defunct. Uh, but we had a lot of um, interaction with, it used to be against the law to meet uh, Palestinians in Israel, you couldn't do it, and you 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 uh, risk a, a jail sentence if you were an Israeli and you did, but we could we could so so we crossed the green line. There was a green line then. There wasn't a wall, but there was a, people were aware of the boundary, and now people are not aware of the boundary because it serves right wing Jewish interests for Eric Yisrael Shlema to think of the whole thing. To, to erase the green line and think it's all Israel. Well, we didn't go to a, a land without a people, you know, people, we, we, we used to call it a land without a people for a people without a land. We didn't have a land, but the land had people and they were rendered invisible. So I, I'm a critic of Israel because I'm a pro-justice kind of Jew. Mm. Um, 
the basic tenet of, I think it's Deuteronomy, maybe some uh, proverb, something, justice, justice shall you pursue. And that was on the wall of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, her, her um, Supreme Court chambers. And it's a ruling principle for me. I, I mean, I am never going to stop trying to do my part to advance justice wherever I am for whatever outgroup I'm near or part of or recognize. Um, again, it's, it's part of fulfilling every aspect of your values and who you are. As we talk about justice, I want to talk about Brandeis. Um, you graduated from this university in 1959 with a bachelor's degree in English and American literature. What originally led you to come to Waltham and what influence does Brandeis have in your work? Well, Brandeis has tremendous influence in my development, not in my work now, but I went to Brandeis. Um, I was the youngest student there. I, I came into Brandeis um, one, like four months after I turned 16. Um, yeah, and I graduated like three weeks before I was 20. So wow. I was 16 to 19. And um, I mean, I was one of those smart little kids. I was always encouraged. I went to Hebrew school. I got A's. I was a good kid. But I never felt like uh, my opinion was valued. I mean, I was a performative smart kid. I wasn't an analytical, critical, engaged smart kid. And I think there's a lot of women like that. You know, we don't trust our opinions. We're not seen. We're not heard. We're talked over. You know, the, you know the drill. But when I went to Brandeis, first of all, I felt so lucky to be there. I didn't want to go to an all women's college. It just wasn't my style. I'm a very social person. Um, but I wanted to go. Brandeis was founded the same year Israel was. That was part of my whole connection. 1948 was a big year for me. My mother was a member of the Brandeis Women's Committee. So the mailings always came into the house. And I saw how the Brandeis Women's Committee was book by book building that library that used to be in what was a stable. I don't know how much you know about original Brandeis history, but when I was there, I mean, you know, there was like meadows, it was meadows and you, <laughs> you could look, you know, you couldn't even see as far as the door to, or the sign to the next building. Now, you know, I, President Sacker used to say, you know, do me something, I have an edifice complex. You know, he, he wanted to build buildings and create programs and make us a world-class university, which he did. But at the same time, we were pioneers. We were, we were really um, breaking ground. And don't forget the 50s were really a somnambulant decade. You didn't have a whole lot of activism. People towed the line. Everybody was kind of conformist, you know, and I wasn't like that. And I didn't want to go to a school. It was like that. I didn't want to go to a school. Everybody had a little, the women had little white collars and barrettes in their hair. You know, we had green book bags and the women wore black and leotards and, you know, no makeup. And, you know, we made out with guys. I mean, we were, we were what the next decade called hippies. You know, or we were bohemians and the next group was hippies. And that suited me. But as I said, the real influence of Brandeis was that I was taken seriously for the first time in an entirely different way. It wasn't like, you know, recite the five principles of the French Revolution. It was like, what do you think? What do you think? And I became a, you know, I joined the, the justice. I really became, you know, uh, very interested in politics and and uh, and very interested in everything that was going on around me and at Brandeis. It was four fabulous years for me. My mother had died in April. I went to Brandeis in September. So I was a very lonely kid, but a very social kid. I acted out <laughs> and it was the right place for me. Um, and I loved the vibe. I loved the vibe, you know, I'm a person who loves tradition, but the experience of Brandeis, of being groundbreaking, of everything you did being the first time it was done, that was quite thrilling. 
I wanted to hear your thoughts on Miss America. And for our listeners who don't know, this is a Hulu series that captures the movement to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Do you believe the story and characters were accurately portrayed? No, I hated Mrs. America. I thought it was grotesque. Um, grotesque, really. It, 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 it hurt to watch it. You felt that it was more done for the money rather than to actually teach a story? I just think it, it was done the way you make something commercial that's too complicated, you know, to do it the right typical way. Typical American cinema. Yeah. Well, typical American TV series stuff. Mm -hmm. I'll have to say some of the best stuff is now on TV in series. But what they did was they put Phyllis Schlafly on the same par as the entire women's movement. You know, they needed conflict. The whole series, but series is predicated on conflict, gives her a weight she never had. That woman could not get on television because there was a fair use principle in television in those years, wish we had it now. But the fair use principle said, you can't have one side in that in, in a, uh, on any talk shows. You had to have both sides, and none of us would go on. Opportunity. We w would go on. We were given many opportunities because they weren't conflict, but we wouldn't give her the airtime. And when we didn't give her the airtime, you know, nobody was interested in her. They were interested in this. You know, it was Trumpian uh, conflict, conflict. Um, you know, and they were uh, Gloria was caricatured. Bella was caricatured. Betty was a little bit, I mean, I know everybody in that, in that sort of women's movement coterie that was portrayed there. It was oversimplified. Um, Gloria was given a, a black boyfriend who never became a person. It just kind of like you felt a, a whole hidden agenda going on there. Um, it was grotesque. And and Moreover, I mean, I did a lot of Zooms about it and wrote about it because I worried that this was going to reify our era. I don't want this to be our history. It's such a bizarre distortion. And if that's what people take away from it, which from the commentary, I know people did. Oh, that was silly. Oh, look what was going on then. Oh, I had no idea, you know. Oh, you know, she was this, she was that, huh? Was that how it was? No, it was not how it was at all. So um, it was a big disappointment to me. And I got really, I, I was very happy when sort of the spotlight moved elsewhere. But there was a, a month or so there when you couldn't escape it. Over the span of the last year and a half, how have you seen this pandemic interact with women's rights? Um, well, Both good and bad. Yeah, um, I think that the most troublesome takeaway from the pandemic is that you saw how limited women's options were. You know, the minute that the architecture of their childcare arrangements collapsed, it was like back to the kitchen. It was like, you know, well, which of us is going to, you know, continue working because now, you know, we have to do 10 hours of childcare on top of what was a job. And women were sort of thrown back into traditional roles, domestic roles, their professional lives suffered, their cultural lives suffered, their, their um, interactional stuff. I mean, the, and I wrote a piece about the, the good thing that we got out of our isolation was we all learned to be techies in a way we never had been. You know, it was the way men, in my generation, couldn't type. Oh, they couldn't type. Oh, they, you know, it's just women's work, you know. And now you see guys on their computer and they're, you know, typing like Betty Boop in, in some <laughs> secretarial drama. Men learned to type. They learned the keyboard when it was of interest to them and when they needed it. And we learned Zoom and we learned how to produce newsletters and we learned how to get in touch with each other and organize actions during the pandemic in ways we had never before because it was like, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't do that. I'm a technophobe. That's too, too hard for me. And, you know, we're wonderful, we're brave, we're courageous, we're smart, but sometimes we opt out. We do. We just opt out. Um, we're uncomfortable under the spotlight or we're afraid of conflict or we imagine that we don't, can't do math. I mean, I see men who, who can't read a, a 
uh, an annual report or profit and loss statement, and I can. It, you know, and they get away with kind of, oh, men do the money in the house, you know? And of course they don't, they don't understand that any better than most of us do. And I think women learned that they could get along, they had to get along, they couldn't turn to other people to do stuff for them because everybody was uh, shut down and hunkered down. So that was a kind of surprising good takeaway. But what it did to women's roles, how it threw us back in such a narrow path and box, that was deeply troublesome to me. And we also saw how many women were holding up the world in terms of healthcare workers, in terms of service people. You know that, you, you've, we've, we've all heard that. We all know that they got COVID because they couldn't afford to work from home. And such a large percentage of them are in so-called women's professions and service professions. And um, I think that sort of highlighted uh, a, a hidden a reality that most of us have the luxury of not looking at. Ms. Pogrebin, thank you again for joining the program today and providing tremendous insight. Thank you, William. Thanks for the good questions.